Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 306 Rhetoric of Pop Culture with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And once again, we are diving into cell now with a new perspective, this time on something called the visual perspective. So we've been, we talked about visuals and images and symbols all along here and also with the uh, McLeod book. Uh, but here we're really zeroing in just on images. Uh, so we'll talk about the nature of visual communication and some fundamental theories and principles that ground it, such as one of my favorite theories of all time, Gestalt theory. Uh, we'll also talk about visual pleasure theory, which is pretty weird to say the least, uh, as a means to examine underlying messages about subjectivity and sexuality and visual artifacts through fetishism, voyeurism, and narcissism. So we'll probably spend most of the time on the Gestalt theory, but also, of course, we'll cover some of the uh, stuff there from Laura Mulvey and visual pleasure theory, because it's very, uh, uh, very useful if you want to talk about film or te television. Okay, so some terminology to start off here. There's always terminology. Remember, every perspective is a term is a terministic screen. Uh, there's certain vocab, certain terms, certain concepts you'll have to work into your paper. If you're, if you're saying, I'm doing a visual perspective, uh, then I expect to see some of the vocabulary from this uh, chapter in your paper. Uh, but anyway, if you remember when we talked about that musical perspective, uh, they spent some time basically distinguishing different ways you could study music from rhetorical. Uh, so, for example, just as with music, you could just talk about the aesthetics of it, the beauty of it. Uh, you know, if you're going to uh, an art gallery looking at art, especially if it's a modern art, uh, you might look at something uh, it looks just like some lines and boxes to you, right? And you say, what in the world is this? That's not art. And somebody else <laughs> there might say, oh, I beg to differ. You know, this is a, you know, so-and-so. And if you look at the composition and blah, blah, blah. Uh, in other words, you have to learn how to appreciate some of these works of art. You have to know about the history, what was going on, what's the theory behind it, and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, the kind of stuff you get up to in an art history class or an art appreciation class, something like that. And so that's, again, not what we're concerned with here at all. Uh, there's also visual communication, which is kind of a, a more scientific view. You know, you think about images and what's going on in the brain. We'll talk a little bit about that. It is relevant, uh, but it's just not, we're not really zeroing in on like uh, scans of the brain and how the eye works or anything like that. Um, and then lastly, visual rhetoric, which it is what we're concerned about. So what we're looking at is, okay, they got these visuals out there, pictures, images, whatever the case may be. They're communicating something. Okay, uh, but is what they're communicating persuasive somehow? And more particularly, is it beyond just like a simple persuasive message, like an advertisement? You know, is there something bigger going on, some broader ramifications of that, uh, especially if you see hundreds and hundreds of these sorts of images or even thousands across the, you know, a month or a day? Uh, do they add up to reinforce or challenge some kind of taken-for-granted ideological belief or behavior? In other words, uh, the hegemony, if you remember that from the Marxism and the uh, feminism chapter. All right, so she talks a little bit about the history of visual communication, and this, to me, is profound. Uh, you know, I'm an English professor. I tend to work a lot with the written word, language, literature, but in reality... The artwork, you know, visuals have been around a lot longer than any kind of written word, you know, writing. Uh, and this is just one example. You can, you can, uh, <laughs> you know, spend weeks, or I guess a lifetime, you know, studying these ancient cave paintings and things. I think this is one from a cave in France. Some really good shows you can watch about this if you want to see more of these images. Uh, I think this one is dated 30,000 to 28,000 B.C., uh, so it's it's really fascinating to go deep inside these caves. Maybe nobody's been in there for God knows how long. And, you know, I guess they look on the wall and they're like, there's this, <laughs> there's these buffalo or whatever the, uh, the case may be. And yeah, it's a little bit creepy, but, you know, on the other, other hands, it's kind of cool to think, you know, wow, I'm, you might be the first person to look at this image that somebody painted, you know, 30,000 <laughs> years ago. I mean, <laughs> it's a pretty mind blowing. Uh, but a lot of these images, we really don't know what the purpose was. I mean, they can speculate about it. There's theories, there's ideas. But, I mean, I think the point is 
you know, they're doing something here, and it probably is some kind of rhetorical, ideological uh, message here. We don't really know what, what it is at this point. Uh, but I think that the bigger point is just that we've been communicating with visuals for a lot longer than we have uh, other means. And also, I don't know if I put this into this lecture or not, but, you know, again, as an English professor, I'm, I'm very interested in writing. But I was listening to a lecture series, not, not, not too dissimilar to this one, actually, and the professor was talking about art and, and prints. And you think about these... Uh, you think of the printing press, you probably think about the, you know, like uh, typing, right, and the written word. Uh, but his point was you could make these woodcut images and, you know, basically just take a piece of wood and draw or, I guess, etch out, you know, with some chisels and some tools on that piece of wood. And then they could just kind of stamp that on onto paper and make a, like these uh, prints and woodcuts. And his argument in that lecture was that that was actually very, very important for science. It was a huge breakthrough because for the first time, you could sort of mass produce these really realistic and accurate images, for example, for anatomy. And so the real famous anatomy book where they, uh, you know, they got, I guess they got the scientists, the dissections, they drew out, drew out all the stuff anatomically correct, and then were able to... Uh, you know, same thing with birds. There's a big famous one with birds. But they're able to use that sort of print technology, but instead of words, it was these images. And it turned out to be very, very useful for science. Like the bird bird watching one uh, was another breakthrough. I mean, for the first time, you can, like, see drawings of these birds from all over the world. Uh, whereas before, there, there might be crude drawings, but it was like somebody tracing, basically, or trying to imitate what, you know, what they saw. It just wasn't anywhere nearly as as, uh, as good as that. Uh, so anyway, I, I just throw that out there. You know, again, we tend to privilege the uh, written word a little bit too much sometimes, uh, when really art and visuals play just as big of a role in rhetoric, if if not more so. All right, a little bit more terminology here. We've got pictograms and ideograms. And when I think, what is the difference between a pictogram and ideogram? And I just say, think about the way the word sounds. Picto, picture. Right, this is a picture. You know, a picture looks like something, right? You take a picture. <laughs> Unless there's something really freaky going on with the uh, way that film is developed or, I guess, the digital processing on your camera. It's going to look like the thing you took a picture of. It's a pictogram. Uh, so here we have uh, an image that's actually two in one. Let's talk about the pictogram part first. So the pictogram looks like the thing it's supposed to be. Uh, so it's a cigarette here with some smoke coming off of it. You know, it's a no-smoking sign, right? But the smoking part is conveyed by a pictogram, a little picture. Okay, it's not like a photograph. It's pretty simple. It's just some lines, some wavy lines, basically. Uh, but everybody looking at that says, oh, yeah, that's a cigarette. Uh, you might, you know, as a little kid, we'll get into this with visual literacy here in a second. But, you know, a little kid might look at that and be like, what is that image? Uh, I have no, what is this thing? You know, what is that? Oh, that's smoke, dear. <laughs> uh, so there's some learning that has to take place. But basically, it looks like a cigarette, okay? The ideogram, this doesn't look like a thing out in the real world. Uh, it looks like an idea, something that doesn't really exist in an object that you could point at and say, oh, look, look, there's a no over there. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Don't you see that? No, you don't talk like that because it's, you know, kind of ridiculous. <laughs> no is an idea, right? It's, it's a concept. And the way it's conveyed in a symbol form, or one of the ways it's conveyed, is with this, what I call the Ghostbusters symbol. I don't know what you call this, but it's a circle, red, it's a red circle with like a bar running diagonally across it. I call it the Ghostbusters symbol. Uh, that's the idea of no. So what this, taken together then, you look at this sign, you say, oh, that means no smoking. The smoking is the pictogram part, and then the no is this uh, red circle with the red line through it. And that's about as deep as we're going to go into the world of visual communication. Uh, now, visual literacy, you know, as I just talked about there, uh, and sometimes McLeod talks like this. He says, well, if it's a picture, you don't need, or if it's an icon, you don't need anybody to tell you what it means. It, it just looks like the thing. Uh, but I'd argue that he's wrong about that. And most of the time, you do need some kind of training. Now, you it might be real simple training. You know, you might be a little kid, and somebody points out, well, that's a cigarette, you know, and that's a symbol for smoke, and uh, that sort of thing. But it, 
you know, I, I don't think just somebody who had never seen this before would be able to look at that and say, oh, that must be smoke. I mean, it could, you know, looking at it now, I might say, that kind of looks like a little caterpillar, maybe, a little worm popping out. <laughs> uh, who knows? Uh, so I'd argue that I think it's kind of false to think that visuals are just easy and simple and, and the written word takes all the hard work and you can just, anybody can just look at a visual and figure out what it means. Uh, no. You know, so I agree with this idea of visual literacy, just like you have regular, regular literacy means you can read and write. Uh, so visual literacy is, means basically the same thing, but it's being able to make sense of images, anything from posters, TV shows, animation, uh, you name it. Uh, and then like languages, these visuals have rules and conventions. So you can't just put a sentence together just any old way you want, just words at random. Uh, you say, oh, I decided I'm just going to, you know, put the of at the beginning or at the end. You know, you can't can't do that. You have to follow the rules or it's just going to be gibberish. Uh, and it's not like these rules never change or that they're the same no matter where you go. Uh, you know, colors, for example, mean very different things. If you go to, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the examples, but like there's a, I think black means sort of uh, like mourning. You go to another country, and it's the exact opposite. There's <laughs> all kinds of examples like that. Uh, but anyway, there's some kind of, you just like there's different languages, uh, there's different uh, visual languages. You know, again, it could be the colors, it could be the textures, the symbols might mean things in different countries, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the point is, it's not just random. You know, we as a society, as a culture, kind of agree, well, this color will mean this, this style kind of goes with that idea, uh, these textures, and... Uh, on and on and on and on and on. Some people, frankly, know a whole lot more about it than I do. All right, Gestalt Theory. Uh, and what I love about this, it kind of connects back to Kenneth Burke and also the Symbolic Convergence Theory, Fantasy Theme Analysis, uh, because it's about putting things into groups. You know, pattern recognition is basically what we're talking about here. Uh, humans, you look at a bunch of dots or flowers or whatever it is, and your brain just automatically starts trying to put things into categories, trying to make sense of what, what that is. Does that belong with that? Where does it belong with this group over here? Uh, you know, which of these do not belong? What belongs in the same group? And so on and so forth. That's really gestalt uh, theory, what that's all about. And the, a couple things to notice here. It's kind of subtle. Sometimes it's not obvious. Now, I'll tell you this. Once I start pointing these things out to you, you're going to start noticing them. You're going to be freaking out because you're going to be looking around. You're going to be watching TV, commercials, seeing billboards. <laughs> and you're going to be looking for like this gestalt theory. And like, oh, wow, I never noticed that before. That's pretty cool that, you know, this, this pattern over here, this grouping, uh, even stuff like the common fate. You know, I don't know if you'd say that, say it that way. Um, but if you're anything like me, you definitely will start to notice these things. And it is kind of, it's almost like the... Uh, you know that, that movie, They Live, where you have like <laughs> the guy with the glasses where you can see reality, takes them off, puts them back on. He's like seeing uh, what the billboards really say, kind of the underlying message beneath that. Pretty cool movie if you've never seen it. Uh, they Live, you know, look for that one. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting kind of off the topic here. Uh, the idea is that once you start to realize like how this theory works and what's going on mentally with these patterns, uh, you can start to see how they could be used in a persuasive fashion. Uh, it could just be unconscious, somebody really thinking about it. Just say, oh, that looks nice, you know, and, and they do it a certain way. Uh, but your job as a critic will be to look in there, use the theory, see is there some kind of underlying message here, some kind of suggestion about proper behavior, proper roles. Uh, and then once you come to that decision, you can say, is it, is it good or bad? Uh, so one of the examples that gets used a lot here is uh, called tokenism. You know, you probably have heard that term before, just sort of, uh, instead of being really appreciative of diversity, really being inclusive, uh, you just kind of want to tick a box or just say, well, look, you know, my job's done. You know, we have uh, some representation there, but it's not authentic. You know, it's, it's why it's uh, called tokenism. It's not an authentic form of uh, inclusivity. And you see it all over the place. I won't delve into it too deeply here, but it is a topic a lot of students like to write about when they... Uh, do their rhetorical uh, analysis. All right, and here's the principles, and I'll go over these really briefly, and then we'll uh, give you some examples of uh, how they could be used rhetorically, show you some advertisements and talk about some other things. Uh, proximity, elements which are close together that seem to be a group, and this they're just doing this, let's just work with these uh, dots and shapes for now, and then we'll get into the uh, 
and how it works uh, rhetorically. But you can see when you just when your eye looks over here, you probably see like three groups, right? <laughs> And then if you, you say, how, how did you do that? How did you decide that there were three groups here? Well, it's because they're kind of clumped. It's like three clumps, you know, three rows, right? So those are proximity. All right, pretty easy. Uh, closure, remember this from a cloud, right? You leave out little little legs of the star or little uh, piece curves of that circle, but your mind just kind of fills in, in the rest. You see a circle, you see a star. Closure, same as from a cloud. Uh, similarity, again, pretty obvious what's going on there. Elements which look similar seem to be a group. So you can see some of these are circles, some of these are these uh, uh, stop sign shapes, <laughs> uh, whatever that's called. Is it a hexagon, I think? I don't know. Uh, common region. Elements which are close together seem to be in a group. So this is one that I don't know why there's a separate one. It kind of feels like some of the other ones to me. Uh, the continuity one I like. So elements which are ordered in a line or curve se seem to be in a group. Uh, so when I look at this, number five, I see two groups, and then I see a bunch of random sort of elements. And the, I think what's happening there is like this is kind of forming a continuous line. And then once you get beyond there, these other ones are just kind of spread out. doesn't look like much, right? Uh, figure in ground, so this is kind of like, what's deeper inside the picture or further away from the viewer versus what's up close to you. You tend to what, notice what's right in front of your face, uh, so to speak, than the stuff in the background. Uh, symmetry, this is a pretty cool one. So this is kind of, I always think about this as the idea of balance and both sides, left and right, uh, being equal. So you can see how that kind of looks like a group. And that one looks like a group, even though these are different symbols, like that's a square, or this is like a curly bracket. You know, so you got some curly brackets and some circles, but the whole thing kind of feels, it feels like two groups to me because of the symmetrical idea, right? These are kind of balanced here, and so it looks like two groups. Uh, and then the common fate is one that pertains to animation. So once you have stuff moving around, like some birds flying, if you ever look at uh, ducks or geese flying in the, you know, flying south for the winter, you notice they don't just, uh, it's not just spread out in a random fashion, but they kind of follow a certain, uh, you know, a certain shape, kind of a V-shape. So you know those are, those ducks go together. It's just one group of ducks, one flock, I guess. Uh, okay, so how can you use these principles rhetorically? And I always uh, uh, think it's fun to think about grocery stores. I don't know why I do this. I guess because we all go to grocery stores. <laughs> but next time you go to grocery stores or Walmart or Target or whatever, uh, Take a few minutes as you're shopping uh, to look at, like, how do they organize the store? How do they put certain items together on these shelves? What's next to each other? What's at the, what, you know, what's, what do they separate on, on the other ends of the store uh, versus what's close together? Now, remember, the proximity idea is that things which are close together seem to be in a group. So if you're in a grocery store and they're putting stuff together, uh, that seems to suggest these things go together somehow, even though they arguably don't. Uh, for example... Dixie cups It's a drinking cup. You put your water in there <laughs> or other substances. <laughs> uh, but then they got these uh, ping pong balls right next to them. Well, what's that about? So you look at that and at first you're like, what in the heck do ping pong balls have to do with these Dixie cups? Uh, who knows? But if you... Uh, you might ask somebody, well, what's going, what does this have to do with this? And they say, oh, that must be for that, you know, drinking game. Uh, so now you're starting to associate these Dixie cups and the ping pong with, with alcohol, you know, and just all uh, suggest that there's a relationship there. Uh, and it's kind of like Walmart is a, or whatever store this is, is kind of making that argument uh, that these things go together. And then over here is another example you might see uh, Coca Cola Life. I guess it's some kind of like healthy version of uh, Coca Cola, supposedly. <laughs> but look at where it is in the store. Like it's over there by the fresh vegetables and fruits kind of a suggestion there is like this must be healthy you know, it's over here with these healthy foods you know if you want the unhealthy stuff you know you go to that canned aisle <laughs> you know i love canned food but uh you know what i mean right like that's the stuff that's in the cans and the frozen stuff somehow does the same as healthy as the stuff over here in this, this fresh produce aisle uh, so they stick the coca-cola life over there and that kind of uh, goes along with that idea that it's somehow healthy kind of healthy by being close to the other healthy foods and i'll show you some of these things are related 
So it's not like these are completely separate ideas. Uh, closure, if you remember, McLeod talked about that also with, uh, I think he had sprites, and you could like only see part of the sprite label, but your mind kind of filled in the, the rest. It's pretty common use, pretty common use in advertisements because when you look at like this image here, you might not be aware of this, but you see like it doesn't actually say Coca Cola across the top of that cap. You only see like Coca and then C O, and the rest is obscured by that uh, uh, bottle opener. So your brain, to make sense of this image, again this probably happens at a split second, but somewhere in your brain you're like Coca Cola. So you have to uh, do a little bit extra mental work to figure out, what am I looking at here? Oh, it's Coca-Cola. Uh, you recognize that. And there's something about just thinking about it more, even that little split-second lingering thought will make you more, uh, arguably anyway, make you more disposed to want a Coke. <laughs> so it's like making you do a little bit of extra work to make sense of what you're seeing. Uh, and that little bit of extra time thinking about the concept makes you thirsty for a Coke. Keeps it, uh, puts it in mind a little bit better than just spelling it out for you. Uh, similarity. Elements which look similar seem to be in a group. Uh, so there's, if you like beer uh, or any kind of fancy drinks, you notice there's there's like this idea of the craft brew, the uh, micro brews versus like the, the <laughs> Anheuser-Busch's of the world. <laughs> I think they call them the macro beer. You know, I don't know how much I want to talk about beer here. Uh, but anyway, the idea is that uh, there's these companies that are putting out, you know, these big companies like Michelob, who ever, you know, the, the big factory beer, basically. Uh, but they're trying to make these other brands, or they're trying to make their beers look like the craft beer. Uh, so people that are that don't know any better, they're there in the store, they're looking for like one of these craft beers. Uh, and they come across this shock top. I don't want to pick on, on shock <laughs> top. Uh, but you can see like in the blue moon here, you can see how the just the design and you know again the proximity you know they're they're close to these genuine micro brews like down here we have the stone up there you have the ballast point uh, and then sort of in between sort of by association you have these micro brews which are really put out by those big big um, breweries but you know by the, those principles of proximity and similarity they uh, kind of become associated uh, so even if uh, you know, even if you're aware uh, somehow it kind of mentally feels more like that craft experience uh, than the mainstream, uh, <laughs> you know, big booths. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, okay, uh, continuity is an interesting one. So elements which are ordered in a line or curve seem to be in a group. So I think about this, again, coming back to Walmart. When you go to Walmart, how many times you go there and you're like, oh, my God, I need to check out where's the line. And then you're like, oh, there's all these people. Uh, who's actually waiting in line and who's just like shopping because sometimes they put like stuff here for you to look at and you, you're trying to figure out what, what's going on so really what you're looking for is a continuity and so eventually you see okay well there these people are kind of in a line so they go together this must be the group for this you know, like the two aisles that are actually or the two cashiers <laughs> uh, um, uh, the two registers I guess that are actually working so that's the line for one that's the line for six or whatever uh, that's the principle of continuity. And, you know, this one's, uh, there's some pretty bizarre stuff. Like, people had this tendency to want to wait in a line. Uh, you know, sometimes this one's, uh, I hear people say, well, how do you decide what restaurant to go to? And they'll say, well, I'll look for the one with the, you know, biggest line. <laughs> you know, sometimes I thought about this when we had a subway here at St. Cloud State. You had the pizza, you know, a lot of options. And to me, they were all about the same option, about the same goodness level. But for some reason, that subway would always have this big line. Now it's Chick-fil-A. So like a Chick-fil-A always has this big line. Uh, so I think you kind of look at look at it that way. You know, it seems to be seems to have something to do with this continuity. Like maybe the two with the big lines must be the good the good ones, the group that you would call good food. <laughs> uh, but you know, if there's like one person over there at the, you know, whatever that poor little. Uh, Oh, jeez, what else do they even have there? <laughs> I don't even, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever the other restaurant is, you know, if it's only got like one person standing there, you know, maybe that principle of continuity would kick in and you'd say, I want to be part of that bigger group. I'm going to go stand in that big line. Matter of fact, sometimes there's been studies where they just have people, they pay people just to go, hey, just go form a line and stand in it. 
and just pretend like you're there for something. Don't talk to anybody about it. And just random people walking by will just see that line, and they'll get in the line thinking, well, there must be something here. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? It's kind of crazy. Uh, it's pretty crazy stuff here, folks. It really is. Uh, the figure in ground, uh, again, this has to do with, like, foreground, background. So you notice here, you got the Coca-Cola bottle sort of closest to the to the camera, if you will. So that you notice that, and then there might be stuff there happening in the background. That easy, it kind of faded out a little bit. And so sometimes they'll use this, again, with the closure, right? Look at that, where that bottle's positioned. Uh, but I think that can kind of suggest a relationship, too. Like, like what's in the background is less important. So there's, you know, if you got a poster of The Walking Dead and you got characters that are sort of in the background versus the ones closest to the camera, that's kind of making an argument as to which ones are more important. All right, symmetry uh, and asymmetry. Uh, you see this in certain kinds of uh, logos and signs, and a lot of this is used, by the way, in a interface design. So when somebody's making a, a logo or they're making a, an interface for an app or something, uh, they will look at these principles to try to help people figure out like what functions, what buttons go with what, uh, how do you do this other thing, and so they'll use these principles to organize that uh, those menus. Uh, but here we've got a symmetry, uh, you, just so you can see the concept. Like the uh, if if you were to take a knife and like cut that golden arches <laughs> or McDowell's <laughs> uh, logo in half. Uh, it'd be the same on both sides, right? You end up with two equal halves. It's called symmetry. And a lot of people like this. You know, it, it kind of feels balanced. Uh, whereas the YouTube one, you notice it's kind of like YouTube. And this part doesn't, you can't, if you split it in half, you'd end up with two different parts. And so they say sometimes the asymmetry works pretty well if you want to kind of get attention to kind of startle. Uh, whereas the symmetrical one's a little more peaceful, a little more uh, wholesome, <laughs> if you will. Uh yeah, and here we go with some other examples of uh, the symmetry. And I uh, tried to work in the common fate here. So you might see this, think about parades. Uh, you know, how do you know which groups go with what when you're watching a parade? Or uh, the military uses a lot of, um, or bands, you know, like marching bands, same sort of thing. Uh, they'll, they're kind of priding themselves on this being synchronous, everybody in unison and step, you know, standing very similarly, a certain distance apart. You know, all of that stuff is designed to give this this, this uh, goal of being symmetrical and to provide that, that feeling of pleasure, I suppose, from like everything is in its proper place. Uh, but, you know, it could also be rhetorical as well. And again, you think going all the way back to like ancient Greece, Rome, Sparta, you know, you name it. A part of what made those armies so intimidating and so fearsome was uh, you didn't just have random people, random warriors out there just kind of wandering around, no sense of uh, discipline. You know, when, you're, when they're like, snap to, you know, they, you know, they <laughs> go really rigid like that. And then when they march, it's like, boom, just right in step. Uh, that really gives you the idea, like, whoa, we, this is these people really are well trained. There's a lot of discipline here. Maybe I shouldn't mess with them. <laughs> you, know, that, that, you know, that's kind of the idea there. In the common fate, again, you can't see it just if you're looking at the still photo. Uh, but once that marching starts and you see everything is lined up and they're moving at the same speed and the same direction, again, it kind of reinforces that idea of being uh, orderly, orderly, you know, well-trained. Uh, what's, what's that phrase? Like like a well-oiled machine, you know, is it kind of achieved and when you have both of those going on. Okay, so to move on from that into psychoanalytical theory, so this... When you see that word psychoanalytical, you're basically talking about Freud. A lot of people hate Freud uh, these days. Uh, thought he was uh, a lot of problems with him. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but anyway, there's somebody named Lacan who follows with Freud and adds to it some. This is really weird stuff. <laughs> you know, I just preface it with that. We'll try to make some sense of it. Uh, but some of it makes a lot of sense. So that just psycho psychoanalysis. You're talking about things like the subconscious. You know, the id, yeah, the ego, all, all that good stuff from uh, Freud. Um, now, Laura Mulvey, she's wrote a pretty famous essay about films, and she introduced this idea of the, the male gaze, G-A-Z-E. -E. And the idea is that one woman or man, whoever is looking at the images, you know, put that aside for a second. 
And the idea is that the media encourages viewers to look pleasurably at images via a male gaze. So as if you were, it kind of assumes that you're a male heterosexual uh, actor. I guess they kind of assume you're a male heterosexual. <laughs> a male heterosexual. <laughs> and that you're sort of, uh, you know, forgive me. I mean, this is just kind of sexual stuff we're talking about here. But it's kind of like this idea of you're kind of turned on by the same stuff. Uh, and if you're not, it must be something wrong with you, right? So something, something abnormal. It's kind of the argument that this is making is that all these images accumulated millions, thousands of <laughs> millions, however many there are, uh, sort of have something to say. They sort of play a role in the hegemony. You know, again, go back to that idea of the feminist perspective and how certain ideas about gender roles and what, what's appropriate and so on and so forth get perpetuated. Uh, at least partly through all these advertisements and images and all these assumptions we've been talking about. So that's why you see so many ads that are kind of sexy. All right, they're, they're purposefully designed like that. You could ask, what does this have to do with a Coke? <laughs> Drinking a Coca-Cola? You know, what does she have to do? What's going on here? Who is this even? And it's really just this idea of, well, your eye is kind of drawn to it. It's kind of putting these... Uh, you know, sexual notions into your mind could be very subtle. Not saying you'd necessarily make the connection consciously. You know, the whole point of this is, is this a subconscious process. They're kind of tapping into some kind of like primordial instinctual thing uh, with these sorts of ads. So a little bit more about Lacan then and how all this works or why it works. Uh, Lacan talks a lot about, man, <laughs> you talk about some hard to follow writing. <laughs> Good luck with reading Lacan. Uh, very difficult to make any sense of what he says. Uh, but thankfully, some people have been able to at least figure out this and <laughs> put it into human readable language, uh, I'll say. Uh, anyway, this idea of the mirror stage. So when you're a baby, I guess you don't really realize that your body is not just part of the world. Right. You kind of feel like everything just goes together in this one sort of mass. <laughs> you don't really distinguish between where you cut off and the world begins. You kind of feel like you're sort of just one thing. Uh, but uh, at some point, you see yourself a reflection in a mirror. You sort of get this idea, oh, am I like this body? You know, am I in that body? What's going on here? It's like this really... Uh, Lacan talks about this being like a really traumatic thing, like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what in the world is going on? You've been red-pilled or you know, whatever that uh, expression is. And uh, you start to realize that you're kind of caught off in this world, right? That you're the separate being sort of contained within this, this body. But since it's in a mirror, uh, you can't see yourself, right? Not like you can pluck your eyeballs out, turn them around, and, and look at yourself. Uh, everything's just sort of uh, through a mirror, or when you're not looking at a mirror, uh, you're just kind of imagining what you look like, right? And here's, if you remember from a clown, he talks about how you, you sort of imagine, you got, kind of got this crude mental picture of like where your eyes are, where your hands are, where your mouth is. You're probably not thinking about it too consciously because if you did, you wouldn't, you'd, you'd break down, wouldn't be able to uh, focus on what you're saying anymore. So it's just kind of rough and ready self-image uh, that you carry around with you. Uh, so that's part of the idea. And once you kind of wrap your head around that concept, uh, then you can start to get into like how this plays into self-images, uh, self-esteem even. Like, what do other people think of me? You know, when other people see me, what, what do they see? How does that line up with my, my self-image? Do I have a healthy self-image and an unhealthy one? You know, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is authenticity? Right, once you become aware of this, you might start thinking, well... Maybe I'll uh, smile a lot, <laughs> frown a lot. <laughs> but that might come across like you're putting on a show uh, in front of people all the time. But you're never really your real self, and you start to wonder about other people and the same question. Uh, so that's what brings us into uh, all this stuff. Okay, so I've tried to break this down, but again, it's just kind of weird stuff. You just kind of have to go along with it uh, to some extent. So anyway, we had this traumatic experience of... Uh, hey, I'm not the world, I'm actually in this body, and then there's all this uh, trauma that goes along with that. So how do you deal with it? You, know, you have to resolve it somehow, or try to. Again, this is psychoanalysis we're talking about. Uh, and one of the strategies is called fetishism. 
So this is getting pleasure from openly looking at an object that is satisfying in itself. I was hitch talks in there about how you see an ad. Maybe it's just a close-up of some abs, <laughs> like washboard abs. <laughs> so I guess the idea is you just kind of like looking at that. Or I think she's got another ad in there with some legs. And you just kind of like looking at those legs. Kind of a sexual thing, basically. And it's kind of not a... Um, there's not a lot of reasoning behind it. It's just almost like a subconscious thing. Uh, those aren't those people aren't real like I am. Yeah, so it's called fetishism. I kind of think about this as objectifying somebody. Uh, so instead of seeing somebody as a person, you just see them as a body. It's like, as a model. <laughs> Maybe you don't even see the whole body, just a leg or an arm or something. And you say that is uh, fetishizing. Or, you know, again, I, I use the term objectifying something. You're not thinking about them as a person. You're just seeing that body or body part. Uh, yeah, and I kind of think about this as coming back to this weird mirror image stuff. Like, this is a strategy that says, well, that's not a real person I'm looking at. You know, this is person's not real like I am. This is a thing, not a person. You know, I'm the person. Uh, whatever I'm fetishizing is a thing. You're thing making a thing out of something. Okay, I told you it was weird. <laughs> All right, voyeurism, the feeling of watching someone without their knowing. She says, it's kind of like a peeping Tom type of thing. You think, well, I would never do that. But yet, it's certainly true when you watch movies and shows, there's an awful lot of these, you know, scenes that take place where you feel like, you know, if there was somebody else in the room, <laughs> uh, not just the camera person, you know, obviously, but... Uh, you wonder, would they be doing that? You know, you kind of feel like you're kind of spying or eavesdropping, you know, something like, like that uh, when you're watching these programs. You know, especially when it's like a sex scene or something, you know, something romantic uh, going on, right? It's, it's kind of like you've got this sort of privileged view that you're, you're sort of there uh, witnessing this, but they're not really acknowledging uh, that they're being watched. Uh, so you're seeing somebody as they really are, because you know they're not performing. And again, this goes back to this idea. So if, if you don't think anybody's watching you, you probably don't act the same way uh, that you would at a, in a classroom, <laughs> let's say. And you're watching this on uh, YouTube, you might uh, be doing all sorts of things that you wouldn't do, you know, if you were sitting in a classroom and people were, were watching you. So you feel like, well, maybe that's more authentic. And then now I'm seeing something, somebody as they really are. Uh, and then finally, narcissism. This is the one I think is probably the most relevant for most of us. Uh, so this is, again, you, you want to kind of flatter yourself by thinking that, you know, these, these stars that I like, they're just like me, right? So you find a character in The Walking Dead, say, well, I'm just like Rick, or I'm just like, you know, uh, Glenn, or uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, Carol or whoever, uh, Michonne. You know, you find a character that you like, and one of the reasons that you like the character is because you kind of imagine you're like that, you know, you're kind of uh, thinking, well, that's you know, something like I would do, you know, uh, <laughs> Steve Jobs. <laughs> you know, I think if I just get that turtleneck, I can be uh, more like Steve Jobs. You know, I'm already a lot like him because I'm so brilliant and you know, <laughs> innovative. <laughs> Why not just go all the way, you know, and, and wear the turtleneck? Uh, I kind of be a little bit silly, but, you know, that seems to be sort of subconsciously what's, what's going on there. Uh, you're kind of flattering yourself by saying, I'm just like that you know, star athlete, or I want to be like that athlete. Uh, how could I do that? Well, maybe, you know, that person seems to like that color, or that person's got, you know, that line of perfume or cologne, so I will, uh, you know, if I smell like him, <laughs> maybe I'll be like him. <laughs> All right, so I wonder if you want to conduct a visual analysis. How do you do it? Uh, well, the first thing is to find an image like this Walking Dead, famous, very famous Walking Dead poster. And when I look at that, I see it's kind of interesting. You got all these cars coming on the one side. They're stuck. And then you got this guy on the horse who, you know, is, is just Rick and all by himself over here on the right. So I just kind of look at this and I think, you know, it must there must be some kind of like gestalt principles at play here. Maybe I could look at like that, uh, the proximity, uh, common fate, you know, all, all those sorts of principles, but it would kick in here. So you got something here that's not, it's not necessarily obvious. Just looking at it, you kind of feel like you need to study it, do a little analysis to really figure out what it means. So that's just the first step. You know, it could be almost any kind of image 
Uh, but the idea is you want it to be something that does require a little bit of unpacking, a little bit of analysis and explanation. You know, if it's really obvious what it means, uh, there's no real point in writing a paper on it, right? Uh, all right, step two, um, think about those uh, principles, again, the gestalt principles, as well as these uh, fetishisms, the voyeurisms, the narcissism. You know, you think about The Walking Dead and these scenes like uh, sort of erotic scenes, adults, you know, kids look away scenes. <laughs> uh, you could say that's kind of those, uh, the voyeurism is going on, or maybe the, the fetishism, depending on, on how it's uh, uh, filmed. Uh, you know, this one here, you got kind of that proximity thing again. Let me move my, myself there. As you can see, Rick is kind of in the front, and these other characters are in the back. One of them is actually facing the other direction. You know, there's, that's kind of interesting, which characters are looking at you versus looking away and so on and so forth. Uh, so you could do a little analysis, trying to figure out what does that mean? Are there some underlying messages there that aren't obvious? Look, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know so that's why you do the analysis. You, you, know, you look for something. Uh, and then you evaluate the implications. Uh, you know, you say, if, okay, so I think there's some, some kind of unspoken, underlying, hidden message, whatever. Uh, let's say it is true. It's there. You did your analysis. You say, I found this message. And then you say, is it good? Good message or bad? And, of course, that's going to be depending on what perspective you're using, right? But you're just because something could be really effective, but that doesn't necessarily, maybe in a moral sense, it's uh, bad, <laughs> And so here we have, uh, I had a student that wanted to, uh, she did her thesis on these uh, two magazines, the, the Women's Health and the Men's Health magazine. And she was using the gestalt principles as well as the fetishism and, and voyeurism. And she talked about how these, uh, or she looked at these, the words, like, I forget what these, the t subtitles or, you know, whatever, these like points are, get back in shape. I don't know if those are called headlines in this context, but anyway, these these texts. <laughs> and like, what were the words? And she had like categories for like, did it have something to do with uh, being successful, being intelligent, something like that? Or did it have something to do with like being sexy and uh, you know, something to do with the fetishism? You know, like um, butts <laughs> there on the left uh, versus like muscle, or I guess those two would be in the same, look better. So I forget how what conclusions that she came to, but I think what she just figured out was that the in the case of the women's health, the women tend to have less clothing on for one thing, and the words were almost always something to do with like fetishizing, and something to do with sexiness or dieting or something, and they'd be like really close to her body, if not like on top. You can see like the like that sexiest there, kind of like almost it's like part of her, right? Covers up part of her. You know, same thing over here, though, with the, the great abs. I mean, you know, he's, he's got a shirt on, but like, look at that, how close that <laughs> abs is to him. Uh, anyway, she got kind of technical with it, but, you know, that, that was a sort of idea. You look at this over time. Uh, this is not the best example to make, let me make the point. She had a, I think it was Men's Health with uh, President Obama on, on the cover. He was like in a, you know, his suit looking very, you know, like an executive professional, like a president, presidential. <laughs> and like the words were like, you know, all about leadership and you know, all this stuff. And then the women's health one was, you know, pretty much, you know, just about looking sexy and, and dieting, and things of that sort. Uh, so she, you know, looked at all these and she says, look, you know, the underlying message here is that like it's, you know, if the men should be successful, smart, intelligent, blah, blah, blah. And that's the message they're getting. Be strong, you know. Uh, whereas the ones for the women were all like, you know, how to be sexy, uh, you know, um, what is this, dieting. There is something about cash here, but, but again, just looking at, you know, however many magazines, and she found it was uh, not sending a very good message, you know, to, to the men and the women, these magazines. It could be improved. I'm sure she was uh, critical. All right, let's wrap up here then. Uh, so take a look at this sample essay in the back of the this chapter. It starts on page 251. It's called From Seeing to Looking to Participating. Uh, Jonathan Folan, a student example. Uh, so read that. It's a brief essay. And again, pay attention to like how they're working in the sources, secondary sources, and so on and so forth. How they're working with the terms uh, that we talked about here. Uh, and then uh, see what you think. So how do the subject positions of Brandon Tina 
Lana Tisdale, and others help viewers come to accept the argument as valid. And the argument here, and you can see this when you read the essay, but just in brief, uh, that Brandon is not an abnormal object, but a human being worthy of acceptance, uh, respect, and love. So this is the argument. And see what you think about the way that it's made. You know, study that and critique it. Okay, and that will do it for us today. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please do uh, make a comment, ask a question. Love to hear from you. And I'll see you again soon.